one of the uh, pleasures that I have every Sunday morning is being able to sit where I sit over here and um, watch the kids as they go down to foundations. And uh, all kinds of great reactions we get from the kids as they're going to their classes. Today, it has to be Carter, who goes halfway down, and he's torn between who is he going to go with. Is he going to go toward the sound of his father, as Ben is up here making announcements and leading us in prayer, or is he going to heed his mother's gentle call to, come on, boy, come on, Carter, come, come with me, you know. And eventually he made a wise decision, didn't he? You, oh, oh, okay. So, so, let that, so let it be known that Shauna has snacks today, all right? So uh, I know that times people get up and go to the restroom, but today if you need to get up and walk to Shauna to get a snack, it's quite all right. Quite all right. This morning we're going to be in Luke, uh, 24, uh, Luke 24, Luke chapter 7, verses 24 and 35, and our title for today's sermon is, Are You Entertained? And you'll see in our passage today where this title comes from. And for those of you who have not been a part of what we have been doing up until now, we're working our way through the Gospel of Luke. And uh, today's passage is going to take place immediately following last week's passage. You know, that's pretty revolutionary. Uh, In last week's passage, John the Baptist had called uh, a couple of his disciples, had come to, to John and had reported the things that they were seeing and hearing about Jesus. And John says, okay, go ask go ask Jesus this, this question. Are you the one who is to come, or are we to search for another? And the disciples went and they, asked, and they, they, they went to where Jesus was with a crowd of people, and they, and they asked him that. And uh, they asked him the question verbatim. Jesus' first response was not to answer the question, but to demonstrate uh, his Messiahship through the working of miracles, uh, the casting out of demons, raising the dead, doing all of these things that that were, were marks of the, of the age of the Messiah. And then Jesus interpreted what he was doing out of the words of Scripture, uh, out of the Old Testament. And the last thing that he said to John's disciples were, blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Interpreted as, blessed is the one who does not stumble over me because I'm not exactly the way that John thought I was going to be. And one of the things that we're going to see today is that John being part of the prophetic age, he, he could see into the future and he could see the Messiah coming and he was blessed to be the one to announce the Messiah. But until Jesus came, he could only see into the future dimly. And when Jesus came and Jesus ushered in uh, the fulfillment, he was a little bit different than what John had expected. So that is, that is part of why John was, was dealing with some doubts while he was in prison for reprimanding Herod in public. John was the messenger who prepared the way for Jesus. And as the last of the prophets, Jesus is going to say that John was the greatest of the prophets. But then he was also going to say that whoever is least in the kingdom of God is greater than John. We'll talk about what this means. Because what it doesn't mean is it it doesn't mean that that Jesus is is sliding John's role or, or he is getting back at him because John had doubts while he was in prison. Last week's passage was summed up in, in verse 23, and I, in, in my paraphrase of it, I summed it up this way. Do not try, or do not be offended by Jesus. Do not stumble over him because he is not the way you thought he would be, or the way you thought he should be. And the summary line for this week is this, in verse 35. Do not try to satisfy Christ's detractors with the perfect method. They act like they are rejecting the methods when what they are really rejecting is the message. Are you entertained? Here's our passage for this week. Luke 7, verses 24 through 35. It says that when John's messengers had gone, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who are dressed in splendid clothing and live in luxury are in king's courts. What then? Did you, do you see the repetition of what Jesus is asking the crowds? This is the third time now. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you. And more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written. Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. 
I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And when all the people heard this and the tax collectors too, they declared God just, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the purpose of God for themselves and not having been baptized by him. To what then shall I compare the people of this generation? And what are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another, We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not weep. For John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine. And you say, he has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by all her children. Here's the way in which we're going to work our way through this today. We're going to talk about the bridge. We're going to talk about how John is the bridge. We're going to talk about the response to John's message and then we're going to talk about the message itself. And the takeaway that, that should have been on this slide is this, and you can write this down. It says, what is it that grips you? Is it God's message, or is it the approval of the crowd? What grips you? God's message, or the approval of the crowd? Let's look at verses 24 through 28. In this in this part of the passage today, you know, we, we see again that, that Jesus is speaking to the crowds. John and John's disciples have come and they've, and they've presented themselves to Jesus and they've asked the questions and Jesus has demonstrated his answer and, then, and he's told them his answer and then they've gone back to John. So what, what Jesus is doing now, he is, he is uh, talking to the crowds who have observed all of this that has taken place. And one of the things that he is going to do, a very important thing that what Jesus is going to do is he is going to confirm John had it right. John was on target with his message. And as he is doing this, you know, one of the things that we see here, uh, beginning in verse 24, uh, is, is what uh, brought attention to when we were reading the, uh, uh, reading the passage is that several times here in verses 24 and 25 and 26, but Jesus is going to ask this question. What did you go out to see? You know, what is it that you went out to do? And then he's going he's to ask this in an escalating series of questions that's going to start very benignly, and it's going to work itself up to something that is very powerful. Now, in this passage that we're talking about today, there's a whole lot of Old Testament background to it. And one of the, one of the backgrounds, uh, background verses of, of this passage is found in Isaiah uh, chapter 40. When, it's, when, John is, when Jesus is asking the people, he said, what did you, what did you go out to see? And, and actually what they had, what, in Isaiah chapter 40, the prophet had said, in the wilderness, a, a voice cries, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. But what we're going to see here, again, is this repetition of this word, of, of the word see. And so part of the reason why I want to draw attention to this word see, or as we see it here, is what did you go out into the wilderness to behold is this. This word is used six times by Luke, either in the Gospel of Luke or in the book of Acts. And every time that it is used, it's, it's not just a matter of, oh, what did you notice on your drive today? It's more, what spectacle did you go out to see? What was it that caught your attention? We saw this, we saw this word used in Luke chapter uh, 5 when following one of his healings, it says that as Jesus and the disciples were leaving the house where they were at, he saw a tax collector named Levi. It wasn't just that he noticed Levi, but he beheld Levi with that sense of calling Levi to come and to walk with him. In uh, Luke chapter 23, this is the verb that is used when we're told that following the crucifixion, the women followed to see 
where Jesus was going to be laid in the tomb that he was going to be laid. And they saw the tomb where Jesus was laid. And that's important because of on the day of the resurrection, they go to the right tomb and find that tomb to be empty. We also see this same verb in um, uh, Acts chapter 1 when the angels are, are, are talking to the disciples who have gathered when Jesus has been ascended into heaven. And they say, what are you looking up into the skies for? Because in the same way that you saw him go into heaven, you're going to see him return. So when, when Jesus is talking to the crowds and he's asking, what did you go out to see? Again, it's more than just a matter of, did you just notice anything interesting? It really has to do with this sense of, what did you go out to behold? And so here then, in verses 24, the second part of verse 24 and through 26, we see this, we see this escalating uh, series of questions that, that Jesus is, is asking, the, asking the crowds. He says, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? Did you go out to see a reed shaken by the wind? I mean, we could interpret that as to say, uh, did you go out to look at the scenery and the vegetation? Well, not a whole lot of people go out in the desert to see scenery and to go out to see vegetation. It would have been okay if that was why they went. But that's not what he was alluding to. He then says, did you go out to see a man dressed in soft clothing? Well, we know from Mark's description of John the Baptist that 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 would not at all have been appropriate for them going out to see John because Mark told us in and and John Mark told us in chapter one verse six he said John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and and he ate locusts and wild honey so when Jesus is saying did you go out to see a man dressed in soft clothing and then he clarifies that and he says those who are dressed in splendid clothing and live in luxury are in king's courts. This was not the lifestyle of John. It wasn't the way that he dressed. It wasn't the way that he ate. And there's a, there's a secondary meaning to this word that is used here for soft. And that meaning could be effeminate. Did you go out into the desert to see a man who was effeminate? Ah, that's, not, that's not who John was. So you notice what Jesus is doing as he is asking these questions. He's asking questions that everybody, as they're listening to him, they're shaking their head going, no, that's not what we went out to see. No, that's not what we went out to see. And he climaxes it there in verse 26. He says, no, you didn't go out to see these things. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. And so what Jesus is doing is he is affirming for these people what it is that they have gone out into the desert to see. And when he uses that word more, when he says you went out to see a prophet, but you actually went out to see more than a prophet, one of the things that Jesus is doing is, he is he's confirming the reason why they went out into the wilderness to see John, because John was baptizing with the baptism of repentance. But he's also, again, he's emphasizing that there's stuff about John that you don't know that he's going to tell us about. That word more is the same word that is going to be used later in the Gospel of Luke when Jesus is telling us that we should not fear those whose only recourse to us is to kill our bodies. If they kill our bodies, they're done. They can't do anything else. He says, don't fear them. Instead, fear the one who has the ability to cast you into hell. So again, John, Jesus is, is, is showing this, this fantastic ministry that, that John has had. And he says, so what he's going to say in the ways in which that, that John is more than a prophet, he is going to say, John is the greatest of all men to be born to a woman. Why? Because he's the one who was given the ministry of proclaiming the Messiah. Like the prophets, he could see the Messiah coming. He had this message that burned in him. But not only did he was he, was he speaking what was going to come? He actually got to see the fulfillment of what he'd been prophesying. And then Jesus is going to turn right around and say, however, the person who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. What John was is John was a bridge. In Luke's theology, Luke, Luke has two eras. He has two periods that he deals with. One is the period of promise, 
And the second is the period of fulfillment. And John is the bridge that takes us from the prophets and the promise of the Messiah who is going to come to the period of fulfillment when the Messiah is actually here. John is the bridge. And so what Jesus is saying then about John is he's, he's saying that John fulfilled his mission. Now, once again, one of the New Testament, Old Testament references that is not specifically listed here is Malachi 3.1. In Malachi 3.1, the, the prophet said, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, <clears throat> and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. In Malachi 3.1 the, the pronoun says, he will prepare the way before me. But Jesus is reinterpreting Malachi 3.1 in the, in the uh, performance and in the fulfillment of John. It says, he has come so that he can prepare you for the coming of the Messiah. By saying this, God is, Jesus is showing us what God does and who God is. God is the God who goes before his people. He leads his people. You go back to the, to the book of Exodus. And you see these references here. In Exodus, we're told that God led his people in through the desert by the cloud during the day and the pillar of fire at night. And then we have specific references where we're told that God protected his people by having the angel who stood between the children of Israel as they were preparing to cross the Red Sea and the Egyptian armies as they, as they bore down upon them. In the same way that God had, had led his people and had protected his people during the Exodus, God is leading his people and he is protecting his people through the ministry of John. And so we then see what, what, more of what, of what uh, Jesus is saying here. In verse 28, he sums up what I've already said. He says, Behold, I tell you. And it's important for us to, to, to pay attention to this. In, in, in the Greek grammar, there's a, there's a way to do verbs that you don't have to have a, you don't have to have a pronoun. There's a verb that says, that says, you know, tell or whatever. And you can do it in the first person, and, and you can translate it as, I tell you. But whenever the Greek puts this, this verb together with the first person pronoun, it makes it emphatic. And that's how our Bible will, a lot of times will, in, will uh, uh, transcribe this as behold, I tell you. And so again, Jesus is making a big, big deal here with the crowds who are before him when he says, hey guys, I am telling you. This term is used 115 times in the New Testament. Jesus uses it 113 of those times. I am telling you that there is nobody who has been greater than John in the era of the promise. But yet, for the person who is least in the kingdom of God, he is greater than John. Why is he saying that? We'll see in just a moment. John is the bridge. And you notice how John had sent his disciples to Jesus and, and they had, John had had his doubts. Did I get this right? Is it really somebody else that we're supposed to be looking for? Jesus demonstrated and Jesus explained, John got it right. I am the Messiah who is to come. And that's the same thing that he is telling these crowds after John's disciples leave. And so as he tells this to the crowds then, there's a couple of different reactions in verses 29 and 30. In verse 29, it says that when all the people heard this and the tax collectors too, it says they declared God just, having been baptized with the baptism of John. So what is, what is Jesus doing? Why are they responding in the way that they did? What Jesus is doing is he is confirming they made the right decision in going out into the wilderness to see John. And he is confirming them and saying they made the right decision by repenting of their sins and submitting to the baptism of repentance that John had for them. And so as they are hearing that, yes, they had made the right decision, they are, they are beginning to rejoice. 
And one of the things that happens now in the kingdom of God, part of the reason why the least in the kingdom of God is greater than John, Jesus is saying now everything is reversed. Because in the, in the period of the promise, who was it who, was, who, were the, who were important? Those who came from the right family, those who had power, those who had the right position. But now, greatness, brothers and sisters, it is defined as being in relation to Jesus. Who's greatest in the kingdom of God? Jesus dealt with this with his disciples in Mark chapter 10. He says, don't seek to rule over people. Seek to become the greatest servant. Because, I didn't, because the Son of Man did not come among you to, to, to rule and to reign. The Son of Man came to serve. And so what, what Jesus is telling the people as they are responding to this, and, and notice how, how Luke says who it is who it is responding to Jesus. He says it's the, it's the common people. It's the ordinary people. And then he, um, he, he specifically mentions the tax collectors. Next week we're going to look at the response of a sinful woman and how she responds to Jesus. But it's, it's, it's not the powerful who are so glad that, that Jesus is affirming what John's ministry was and saying that it was the right thing. It is the common, ordinary people like you and I. So they are, they are rejoicing because in being baptized by John, they have embodied what it means to, to repent, to humble themselves and to repent. But unfortunately, not everybody, not everybody has that kind of reaction. Verse 30 tells us that it was the lawyers, that it was the Pharisees who rejected the purpose of God. They had been drawn to check out the message of John. They were being drawn already to check out the message of Jesus. They were not going out there because they, they were intrigued and they, and they wanted to see how they could get right with God. They were going out because they felt like they already were right with God. And they were worried that somebody was leading everybody else astray. One of the things, you know, and it's, it's ironic that Jesus, that, that Luke talks about the, the lawyers being some of those who had, rejected, who had rejected John in his message. Lawyers had to go through a very rigorous three-stage process in order to be considered a, a lawyer. And it, in, it involved a great deal of study, and it involved a great deal of time. It wasn't something that somebody could, could go to school uh, to get a degree in and immediately be considered a lawyer. They had to prove themselves for many years that they could rightly interpret Scripture. But one of the, one of the sad things that we see here is even though these guys knew the details about Scripture, they had missed the central message. We talk all the time, talked about it last week. We want you to be in all of Scripture all of the time for all of your life. We want you to know Scripture. But we don't want you to know Scripture so that you can win at Bible, at Bible trivia. We're not wanting you to know Scripture so that you can win an argument in the marketplace. We want you to know Scripture so that you can take it in and it impacts your life and it changes the way in which you live. We want you to know Scripture so that you can see what the central message of salvation is. That's what we want. But the Pharisees and the lawyers, they didn't see that. And that's why we see them rejecting. They, they could have just said that they were rejecting John, and as we're going to see, they've rejected Jesus. But really what they're doing is they're rejecting repentance. For those who struggle with knowing who God is, for those who struggle with knowing who Jesus is, there's absolutely nothing wrong with using all of your mental faculties to seek him out, to search him out, and to try to come to a place of peace and understanding of who Jesus is. But logic and reason ultimately will not allow us to have a relationship with Jesus. It always comes down to an act of faith. It always comes down to, some have called it the leap of faith. It always comes down to taking a step, not exactly sure where our feet are going to land. This is how Jesus calls us to follow him. He calls us to repent, and he calls us to follow him 
But faith is the key that allows us to do that. So then the sad phrase in verse 30 is this. They rejected the purpose of God for themselves. One of the things that I, uh, am resp- that I used to be responsible for at work, I'm not as much anymore as I am, as I am now, was to be involved in um, our anti-fraud uh, possibilities. You know, people stealing money. Sometimes people come in and they try to steal money by using a gun uh, or implied threat. And sometimes people just try to steal money by lying uh, and by, by taking things when they think that nobody is looking, using sleight of hand or using the computer or, or different kinds of things. One of the things that is true about fraud is this. Nobody ever commits fraud by accident. Nobody ever embezzles money by accident. You know, nobody accidentally walks into a, a bank or a credit union and just accidentally find, oh gosh, I've got a pistol in my pocket. I think I'll use it on this, t- on this teller and ask her for some money. Nobody ever does that by accident. It's always a conscious decision. And that's how it is when we, when we choose to reject Christ. It's never... It's never a, uh, an unconscious decision. It's always an act of the will. And that's what Jesus is saying here about the Pharisees. They rejected the purpose of God for themselves. And unless they repent before they die, they will be responsible for the actions of their rejection. And that brings us to the message of what Jesus is saying here uh, to, to the crowds as we come to the close of this passage. And one of the things that he talks about here, beginning in verse 31, is that he, he talks about the folly of trying to satisfy this generation. And notice again how he draws our attention to what he's about to say. In verse 31 he says, okay, he says, to what then shall I compare the people of this generation? And what are they like? He could have just said one of those things, but he, but he said both of those things. He said, and, and he goes on to say that they're like children. Um, they're like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance, and we sang a dirge, and you did not sweep. You did not, you did not weep. You know, I've, I've been in ministry a long time, and I've seen what happens when, when people pay too much attention to uh, those around them who are wanting them to, they, they, they say they don't like their methods, but really what it is that they don't like is they don't like the message. Well, I can remember the days when the, the topics of conversation among preachers was, how hot of a message should we preach? Should we preach a hot message or a cool message? Should we mention hell? You know, or, sh- or should we focus on felt needs, starting with where the people are, as opposed to systematically working our way through the Bible and, and focusing on who God is and what God requires of us? Should we wear tur- should we wear sweaters? You know, Ben mentioned a sweater this morning. You know, should should we should we change it? You know, should we move away from coat and tie? Oh, maybe what we need to do is we need to sit on a stool. Maybe that'll really communicate how cool we are. Or the big one was, you know, preaching is so old-fashioned. That the monologue, it's out of date. People don't want, people want dialogue. Seeing all these things come and go, and in all of them, it's, it's culture going, we really don't like your methods. Jesus says, our children act like, our culture acts like children. In what way? Well, you know, if you've been around children, you know that um, children are uh, always, they're, they're, they're changing their minds. And there's a lot of different reasons why they change their minds. Sometimes they just get bored. You know, they, they don't want to keep doing what they're doing and they want to go do something else. Uh, sometimes it's just because they're emotional, not rational. You know, try dealing with a child who is upset. A lot of times you just, you, you can't deal with them rationally, you know. Uh, and what really doesn't work is that whole thing of, uh, okay, you want something to cry for? Well, let me give you something to cry for. That doesn't work very well, you know. 
Uh, and, and a lot of times children just, they don't understand cause and effect. They don't understand the consequences of the actions that they, uh, that they take. Jesus says that our culture acts a lot like children. They're, they're constantly demanding that we dance to their tune. And they're constantly changing the tune. Or in another phrase, they're constantly demanding, they're constantly moving the goalposts. I had an experience when I was, when Kara and I were in Lubbock, we were dating and, and we weren't married yet. And, uh, but we were, we were dating and I was leading uh, a small group in our adult uh, part of our, uh, a young adult part of our church. And it was a group of 10 or 12 people. It was much like a, one of our life groups where we would meet weekly to, to read, the, read the word, to pray, to care for one another, have, have a small group experience in the middle of this big church. And uh, we had a, young, had a young convert who was coming out of a very rough background who uh, was a part of this group. And the group had already formed and we'd already, we'd already began to, to, to coalesce and to have some momentum. And this girl came to me and she said, hey, you know what, I'm having trouble uh, meeting, uh, making these meeting times. It would be very helpful if we could change the, the day and the time in which we meet. I said, okay. Like I was trying to be kind and trying to be adaptable. I said, okay. She never came. She never came to, to one of the new, the new groups. And my mentor said to me, he says, Alan, you've got to be careful about that. You know, you've got to be careful about what you say yes to when changes like this come up. And what I learned was that, you know, in that small group, we had, we had had a great start, and we had some good momentum going, and there were great things that were happening. We didn't ever have it after we made that change. And she did not mean to do something evil, and she was doing it as a believer. She wasn't doing it as an unbeliever. But it, but it was a good example for me of what happens when, when you have a direction from the Lord and you're headed in the direction that you think the Lord is leading you, and you start listening to those who are saying, we don't like that method. So, Jesus is, is talking about, uh, hey, you guys, you know, you've, you've rejected everything you heard. And really what happened was, John and Jesus, they were, they were teaching uh, the, the same message. Uh, in verse 33, you know, Jesus said, uh, For John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine, and you say he has a demon. And the Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. What Jesus is saying is this. John is closing out the period of, of promise. And as part of the, the message that God had given to John was a message of repentance. Repent, for the kingdom of God is coming. And John's lifestyle and his mode of dress embodied the message that God had given him. That's why John wore the rough clothing that he did. That's why John ate the very rough diet that he did. That's why John's message was what it was. Repent, you brood of vipers, coming out to me for, him for baptism. And Jesus said, you didn't like what the message that John had because you said he has a demon. But Jesus comes along and Jesus' message is different. Jesus' message is the Messiah is come. The Messiah has arrived. And Jesus' message is, is one of, in, in contrast to what John is doing, his message is one of joy and celebration. Go back two chapters in Luke to Luke chapter 5. And the whole thing of the disciples asking Jesus, why do we not fast as the disciples of John do? And, John, and Jesus said, hey, you know, it's like a, we're at a wedding. Nobody's going to fast at a wedding, you know. Uh, so Jesus' time was different than what John's was, but their message was the same. And both of them were rejected. The Jews had leveled serious accusations against John, against Jesus. They had, they had issued accusations against him, and they said, you know, look at him. You're, he's a glutton and a drunkard. He's a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Part of what they could have done using uh, Deuteronomy chapter 21 is 
they could have said, okay, you're guilty of being a friend of one who is worthy of being stoned. Therefore, we are free to stone you also. So, but, but the reality is that it wasn't John's method they were rejecting, and it wasn't Jesus' method that they were rejecting. They were rejecting the message. And Jesus summed this all up in verse 35. In verse 35, he said, Wisdom is justified by all her children. What does Jesus mean by this? He simply means those who have responded in faith to John's message and to my message, they're wisdom's children. Wisdom is justified by those who respond in faith to our message. Jesus and John, they both preached a message of repentance. Jesus and John, they both preached a message of humbling oneself before God. Jesus and John both preached the message of, of um, grasping, embracing the one whom God was sending to be the Savior of all mankind. Well, what does this mean for us? How, does this, how did we come to know Jesus? Since, since we're no longer in the time of, of promise, but we're in the time of fulfillment, what does this mean for us if we are seeking for Jesus? Well, one of the things that it means for us, again, is the fact that during the period of promise, the, the prophets saw Jesus dimly. We have the advantage of, of being able to, of, of Jesus having been fully revealed for us to see. Therefore, we can seek him with, with greater confidence. And just as God has done from, from before time began, Jesus makes himself available to us. He takes the initiative to come close to us and to make himself known. And again, we should seek him with every tool at our disposal, uh, but realizing that at the very end, we have to respond to him by faith. But with John being the bridge from promise to fulfillment, we need to grasp this. When we repent, when we repent of our sins, confess our sins, and embrace Jesus, it leads us into a time of great joy. That's how we know Jesus during the time of fulfillment. Well, what does it mean when we talk about the role reversals in the kingdom of God? On the one hand, John's the greatest man that ever lived because he was the last of the prophets who was able to prophesy the coming of the Messiah and then he was actually able to see this, the Messiah. But yet in the kingdom of God, John's not the greatest in the kingdom of God. One of the things that we have to see here is that the kingdom of God includes both the commoner and the royal. Ordinary, tax collector, sinner, sinful woman. You know, one of the things that we are uh, inundated with this weekend is the death of Queen Elizabeth. And Kara and I were talking about this last night, and we're talking about the death and all these things that we're seeing. And uh, one of, the, one of the, the, the nice things that we hear about the queen is that she really did have a personal relationship with Jesus. And we hear this from so many different uh, people who knew her, uh, respected voices who um, um, had audiences with her and talked with her, that she had a genuine relationship with Christ. And we can also see this in her Christmas messages that she would share with, with the nation during her reign. But Kara told me something last night. I think I may have heard it once before, but hadn't thought about it. And it's a, a little saying attributed to Queen Elizabeth where she said, I wish that Jesus would return while I'm queen so that I could lay down my crown at his feet. In the kingdom of God, both commoner and royal are equal. We have the same privileges. We have the same rights. We have the same responsibilities to live by faith every day for Jesus. That's what we mean by the great reversal. But the final question is this, whose applause do you seek? Where do you seek to get your approval? I have a very good relationship with my boss at work. 
we were having a question, we were having a conversation this week, and during this conversation, part of our, our conversation had to do about Southfield, because she's very interested in Southfield and, and my experiences as a pastor. And, and um, I don't know exactly what it was that she asked me, uh, but I got to talking about a, a change that took place in my life about 20 years ago. You see, as a, <clears throat> as a young man and as a young minister, I had the same ambitions that anybody would have. I had the ambitions of being, quote unquote, the man. I had ambitions of being the pastor that everybody looked up to and everybody thought well of. My books were going to be bestsellers. I was going to have a large church. Life was going to be fun. And that's not how God allowed all this to turn out. Instead of being the man, he allowed me to be one of the men. He has allowed me to be part of a team of bivocational pastor elders who share the ministry of this most precious church in God's kingdom. But even in doing that, for a long time I struggled with being content because of the, t- of the days that I would be getting up to preach. And there might be 30 of you here, or 40. Of the times that... Uh, I'd be up until 2 o'clock in the morning on Sunday morning finishing the sermon. Not because I hadn't been working on it, just because that's what it took to get the job done. And doing the whole thing of balancing how do you work a job, care for your family, and care for the church at the same time. Brothers and sisters, I tell you, being part of a team has been God's great and gracious gift to Southfield. But even then, I, I just was discontented until God slowly, over the years, began to change my heart. To this day, I love for people to come up to me, and I'm not begging here, but the reality is I love it when, I love it when people come up and say, that was a good word today. That was a faithful word. But even if y'all never do, I have to have that for my wife. If there's one person on the face of the earth whose approval I want, it's Kara's. But even that is not good enough. Slowly over time, God began to give me the mindset of seeking to please an audience of one. And I dare say, and we almost came to this during COVID, I dare say that if the Sunday comes and none of y'all are here and it's my time to preach, I'm still going to show up and preach. Because I'm not preaching for your approval before the audience of one. Jesus looked at the crowds and he said, You know, this John came and this was John's lifestyle and his message. I've come and this is my lifestyle and my message. But still, they're not satisfied. They're always changing what it is that's going to make them happy. And so I ask the question, where is it that you seek your approval? From your admirers? From our culture? Or from the audience of one? The message for us today is this. John asked the crowds what they had gone into the desert to see. Had they gone out to see a phenomenon? Had they gone out to see a dandy? No. They had gone to hear a man who had been gripped by a message. And that man had a worthy message to hear. He foretold the coming of the Messiah. God had truly sent John with that message. Yet the people of the generation did not like the message he preached. They were like people, like children, who were constantly changing the rules of the game. They said John was too severe. They then turned around and said Jesus was too liberal. Those were just excuses. What they were doing was rejecting the message. Yet all who received and accepted the message of John and Jesus found life. We want to grow. That growth is marked by a deepening of that same message in our lives so we can be like John. People who are so gripped by a message that it points others toward Jesus. 
let us remember until the day we die that we are not called to be successful but faithful. And our faithfulness is measured by the degree to which our lives are marked by the message that John preached. Someone greater than me has come. He will take away your sins if you submit to him. Little about that level of faithfulness is entertaining, but living it out is the most fun we could ever have. Father, this morning we come to you and we thank you for your word. Father, we thank you that we are able to gather here on this day to celebrate you and to worship you. Father, may you be glorified in the way in which we live out this message this week in the name of Jesus. Amen.